Welcome to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Its 4,500 residents think of their little mountain village as a paradise. John Denver thought so too. He immortalized the region in his famous song, Take Me Home Country Roads. Point Pleasant is located where the Ohio and Kanawha rivers meet in a quiet setting that blends touches of history with still affordable family homes. Today, Point Pleasant is as peaceful a place as its name suggests. But it wasn't always so. In the 1960s, a series of frightening events occur, at first bizarre and disturbing, then suddenly tragic. The story begins when several villagers have close encounters with a semi-human flying creature. Eyewitness accounts put Point Pleasant on the map. It becomes one of the most visited spots in the United States for seekers of paranormal phenomena. It's been over 45 years since the first sighting, but it remains one of the great unexplained mysteries. We kept the kids in at night. We didn't allow them out. Six to seven feet tall, gray in color, a large wingspan, 10 to 12 foot wingspan. Seven foot tall with a wingspan of 50 feet with glowing red eyes. Six feet tall with the big wings and the red eyes, because everybody says there's red eyes. Like, you can't miss that detail. Those eyes, that's, that's what Hera did. It was just a red. A lot of people says it glowed. I don't know about that. I just know it was a red like you never seen red. Uh, one person thought it was a helicopter. It was so big. Another local guy here, he thought it was an airplane. Other people described it as looking like a giant moth because it didn't have a head like a human. It was more in and it had moth-like wings and so forth. Other people described it as, uh, you know, being very quick as far as flight. You know, it would it would appear and then it would be it would disappear. My papa always said it was just a bird because he used to go out there all the time. But he said he saw something out there, so I'll believe him. It had a heel like we do, a heel and a long foot out with claw, uh, toes and claws on the end of the toes. It had a neck like we do that holds a round type head. It had a nose like we do, and I saw two holes that you breathe out of. In the mid-1960s, 100 people claimed to have seen the half-man, half-moth, with huge glowing red eyes flying around the area. For two years, more and more eyewitnesses come forward. Peaceful Point Pleasant is never the same again. Well, Point, Point Pleasant, as it is today, is a very simple, it's a, it's a simple place. And back in the 60s, it was even more so. You had hardworking Americans, farmers, and people like that. They really didn't take stock into monsters or UFOs or anything like that. They worked long days and hard days and there were down-to-earth practical people that went to church on Sundays. This isn't, this isn't something that they plotted or planned. It's just something that happened and they couldn't explain it. And even today, all these years later, it's still a mystery. Some of those, those uh, Mothman witnesses, uh, um, you know, became very, uh, you know, they su suffered nervous breakdowns and, and uh, mental issues and things. And totally different people as to what they were beforehand. Over the years, you know, they just, they never could come up with a, a viable answer as to what, what happened or what they experienced. A lot of people in the town getting thought messages, so they said, uh, saying that something was going to happen. Some people were even having physical effects, like their eyes getting swelled up and red and so forth for no particular reason. In fact, I think a lot of people that had up-close encounters of this Mothman creature. Uh, said that their eyes got inflamed and what have you. It could have been like a, an angel of death or an omen. Like the personification of an omen of coming to warn people that something terrible is going to happen. Fear begins to grip the people of Point Pleasant. Some believe the creature is an omen, a premonition of catastrophe about to fall on their village and its inhabitants. And soon enough, that's precisely what happens. When the bridge fell, it actually tilted to the right, came back up, and then just went down. That is, instead of a collapse like sometimes we see on TV or uh, in pictures, the eyewitnesses said that it actually went to the side, 
then came back up and went down. It's late evening, November 15th, 1966. What happens on this night gives birth to one of the most horrific legends ever recorded in American history. There were two young couples uh, up near the North Power Plant in the TNT area. That was a vacated, desolate area at one time during World War II. That was a uh, ammunitions factory. That's how it got us named the TNT area. They were driving around up there about 11 o'clock at night. Um, they came across what they thought was a man standing in the road in, in front of their car. They noticed something standing next to the plant, uh, which looked like a very large man in dark clothing or uh, a cloak and what have you. And they noticed these two glaring red eyes. And the Scarberry was one of the witnesses said that uh, they were about uh, size of baseballs, about two inches apart. And then she noticed wings flapped around on its back and she said they reminded her of angel, angel's wings. As the car got closer, she said the wings came out and this creature or, or being or whatever ran into one of the, the uh, vacant power plant buildings there called the North Power Plant. And kind of spooked the ladies and they picked up speed and they noticed as they looked behind them uh, that this thing was actually chasing them. That's when this thing came over top of their car. Uh, they were doing 90, 95 miles an hour in, the, in this car coming back to town. And intermittently, this thing would come over the car, then disappear, come over the car. And it chased them back into the city limits, and then it disappeared. And they were thoroughly terrified, but they got home uh, and told their story. And during this time, that started the, the ball rolling on the whole Mothman legend, as it is, one of America's creepiest urban legends. Immediately after the, the two couples saw this thing in the TNT area, they went to the sheriff's department. Now, the sheriff's deputy saw how upset they were. They knew that they, you know, they weren't making this story up. Uh, they sat down and wrote down everything that they encountered. And then the police went up there to investigate. They started running regular patrols. This was on the 15th of November. On the 16th of November, uh, Marcella Bennett and her family actually encountered this thing at, at a house up in the TNT area. Marcella's corroborating evidence makes the community take notice, including her family. I asked my sister what it looked like one day. I said, Marcella, I need to ask you, what does it really look like? Because I was there time after time, but never really got to experience it. And she said, you know what, Carolyn? She said, we were just getting out of the car. We were talking back and forth over top of the car, not paying a lot of attention, not thinking about anything. And I heard something like, shh, shh, shh. And she said, we turned around and looked and it was trying to come through the doors, which they drove trucks and tanks and stuff through them doors, and said that they it wasn't the doors weren't big enough. And I said, well, then how did he get out? And she said he went sideways and came through and flew over top of him. She said, when I looked up and seen them big red eyes, he said, we were out of there. I can't tell you what the rest of it looked like. You can go right down the line through November. You know, there was all kinds of sightings after that. Then the police department started taking it a little more serious. The official record of so many sightings marks a turning point. The residents of Point Pleasant start taking the reports seriously. Many believe something is living near the abandoned munitions plant, something beyond curious, a creature that might actually harm them, and it has a name. The name Mothman was actually given by a, a news reporter during some of those press conferences in the early days of the Mothman uh, sightings. People always ask, well, how did that, how the name Mothman come about? At the time, in the mid-60s, as a little kid, I used to watch the Batman TV series, but there was also the Batman comic book series. There was a character in that comic book series called Mothman. And because people were describing moth-like wings and red eyes, that name Mothman stuck. Now, a lot of local people still to this day refer to it as the Big Bird. Whenever the Mothman was first spotted, uh, it practically covered all of our news areas. It was, it was in the newspaper, big write-ups, and uh, it was on the radio, TV, uh, word of mouth, everybody was talking about it. I mean, it was, it was different. It was a piece of something that they had never experienced before. You kept your kids in at night, your little ones, you didn't let them out. 
newspaper account came out of uh, a big, large six-foot bird with a large wings wingspan and red eyes were chasing cars in the TNT area, which caused a mass uh, amount of people to head for the TNT area to see this this massive bird that was out there chasing cars. That's how the story grew. Even some of the news channels picked up on it. That's when everybody came to started coming to Point Pleasant, including John Keel. The late author, John Keel, uh, really spent a lot of time on this whole thing. He's, he stayed there for several months, I believe, or years, doing research for his work. Uh, he took it as premonitions. And I believe that it was 2002 they came out with a film uh, well, based on his book, The Mothman Prophecies. John Keel specialized in writing about extraterrestrials and UFOs. The Mothman Prophecies was published in 1975 and chronicles Keel's extensive research and theories about the Mothman. He believed it was a creature from outer space. When the Mothman was here, things that happened, and it was a little different, and people were scared because, you know, you're a little scared of what you don't know and they didn't communicate with him, didn't know if he was gonna hurt anybody. He didn't hurt anybody, but uh, there was an animal killed, but it could have been a coyote. But you didn't know what was gonna come up. And people was a little nervous. During the Mothman sightings here in Point Pleasant, they would not let some of the children out for recess because the people didn't know what this thing was. They thought if it was a big bird, it could come down and pick up a little kid and take off with them. So that's how, how paranoid some people were when all this was going on. It was called The Bird. Where, a location where a lot of people were, were seeing the Mothman, uh, known as The Bird, uh, was the North Paraplan, and it was generally known as The Bird House. I think it was tore down in the early 90s. It was uh, deemed a health hazard, and, and they did tear it down, which is kind of a shame, because it would be like a great landmark. We went up there looking for the Mothman all the time. Don't know what we'd have done if we'd have found him. Uh, I wish I could have said, yes, this is what it looks like. But, you know, it was something to do, and you're curious. And, uh, and we went, but we had carloads. He wasn't going to come out when we were there. Everybody wants a glimpse of the Mothman, be it human, animal, or alien. There are as many local skeptics as believers, but the urban legend grows. And so do the questions. Where did it come from? And why did it choose the munitions depot? What happens next raises even more serious questions. The people of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, are used to seeing peculiar apparitions, but nothing like the mysterious and fearsome Mothman. Soon after it appears, other weird things begin to happen. During this whole period, 1966 to 67, uh, people were reporting strange lights in the sky, so we have the UFO connection. That makes it even more stranger than it already is. There was a lot of UFOs in the area at that time. Did I believe it? No. But we would be, my sister and I would be going to Buffalo and we'd get, come out and look and there'd be beautiful lights in the sky and we'd say, well, the UFOs are out tonight. But did I believe it? No, I didn't. And one landed in my brother's backyard. So then I believed it. He said it was the brightest thing he ever seen. And it couldn't, you couldn't even look at it, it was so bright. And it just picked back up and soared back off just like it come in, no sound. UFOs, Mothman, and strange lights in the night skies over Point Pleasant begin to worry the villagers. Then, events take a bizarre twist. This time, it happens in broad daylight. As soon as people started reporting these uh, uh, Mothman and UFO sightings, people started seeing uh, these so-called men in black. Just like in the movies, you know, the black hats and sunglasses, and they were going around intimidating people, saying, don't talk about this. They didn't know if they were government agents, if they were law enforcement people, or if they were from another realm. We would see the men in black standing around on the street in the daytime. I mean, if I go to the bank and get change up the street, they'd be standing there, staring, just staring. Some of those witnesses started saying, hey, you know, these people are coming to our door and asking us questions and, and telling us not to talk about it to anybody. Uh, the local newspaper reporter, Mary Heyer, said they would come into her office and she didn't know them. They didn't identify themselves, but they were adamant about her not reporting 
these details to the newspaper and to the media. So that started to worry a few people because they didn't know what agenda these, these so-called men in black had, but they weren't real happy about people discussing the UFOs or the Mothman sightings. The men in black hang around Point Pleasant throughout the whole time these strange phenomena are occurring. But who are they? And why are they here? To this day, those questions have never been answered. My brother wanted to come up to the TNT area to look for the Mothman, because we'd heard about it that day in school. And we weren't within, I'd say, probably two, three blocks when my brother looked and saw something beside the car on my side of the driver's window. So my brother slammed on the brakes, and when he did, the car kind of turned sideways a little bit in the road. And when we did, that thing just stopped and jumped right onto the hood of the car. And it's just like we were just frozen in time for about I don't know, five seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. Well, it looked through the windshield at us, and we looked at it through the windshield. After it left, my brother turned the car around, and we went straight to the sheriff's department in Point Pleasant. The very next day, soldiers cordoned off all public access to the former munitions plant. So we went back up to the TNT area. There was two or three people standing over there on the side there talking to other military personnel, but they were in suits. So one of them come over here to the car, and he just put his hands on the wind. He said, you were told to leave, now leave. Residents are now really concerned about what's going on. They realize these military operations mean serious business. What are they looking for? Once again, more unanswered questions as the mystery deepens. One of John Keel's books, he talks about, it may have been actually one of the Mothman prophecies, he talks about window areas, which are like um, parts, like areas of, of uh, land or some, like in various places around the earth and the globe, that uh, they're more akin to like paranormal activity. And I think that's what uh, Point Pleasant is. There were several people including John Keel, that was receiving uh, prophecies for future events, some of which came through, some of which didn't. Um, there were strange phone calls, and some of these calls involved voices that were giving these prophecies. The Mothman is something that scared a lot of people. I believe, personally, that there was such a creature I don't think, however, it was a UFO. I don't think it was an occupant from a, another planet. That is partially the belief system for a lot of people. Small town in the 60s, they didn't have all the lights and the glitz and the technology, so they simply would have enjoyed these stories, and it would have excited them and scared them. And fear can generate all kinds of responses. The people of this once quiet village turn to local Native American history and legends for an explanation as to what may be happening. Some people felt that that went back years ago to an to a Indian curse that w uh, was bestowed on the town of Point Pleasant by an Indian Chief Cornstalk. Uh, what happened was is Chief Cornstalk and his son both were murdered over a land dispute over, you know, with some settlers. And the story went that up, up on his dying breath, he cursed the town of Point Pleasant for the next 200 years. Uh, some people do believe that. But Chief Cornstalk did exist, uh, his son, and they, and they both were killed. Now, whether or not he did put that curse on the town of Point Pleasant remains a mystery. Of course, everything that happened, if we had uh, uh, a wreck happened, it was either Cornstalk or Mothman. Uh, if we had uh, a FAR or a power outage, or uh, mainly their power outages and stuff like that, they contributed to, to Mothman. As far as the Mothman goes, I, I believe it's just something we haven't discovered yet, or something that did exist and may have died. It's something natural. 
This is what the bottom line is. Now, the supernatural element is as romantic and uh, as elegant as it is will be very, very hard to prove. While the residents of Point Pleasant try to connect all the dots and make sense of the strange things going on around them, no one could have predicted what happens next. In November of 1966, you know, the Mothman sightings began, the UFO activity, the men in black, uh, all this was, was going on at the same time. Apparently, people were getting thought patterns, like something bad is gonna happen, something really terrible. People are having dreams, um, seeing presents floating in the water and so forth. Really weird, bizarre dreams, but they didn't take it to heart, really, because they just figured it was just a weird dream. In December of 1967, uh, December 15th, the Silver Bridge, which was a 40-year-old bridge right here in downtown Point Pleasant, collapsed uh, on a Friday evening during rush hour, uh, killed 46 people. This event brought more attention to Point Pleasant, besides the, the Mothman sightings. Some people felt that it was just a very odd timing to the Mothman activity and the UFO activity. They felt that there may have been some sort of a connection. Obviously, the it was a terrible tragedy. The, the, we knew most of the people that went down on the bridge. In fact, the, the parents of the mayor at that time was, was, were on the bridge. Uh, a little girl that was in my classroom was on the bridge with, with her parents. Some people f claimed to have seen a large bird flying back and forth across the river days before that bridge fell. There were other people that reported seeing men dressed in black clothing climbing up and down on that bridge. Now, whether those sightings or reports can be validated is, is another story, but people did come forth and say that. A controlled group conscious, if you will, is something where a group of people can see something, or one person will see it, and then another person will see it, and then it will go down in that group, in that community, whatever it is. It's definitely real. We saw it, I saw it too. Then it becomes hysteria. So in a small community, sure. I saw it, you saw it, it's real. And they're gonna stick by that. It almost becomes a religious experience. Now another aspect to that is the belief system. Once you believe in something so, so strongly, it will stay with you over years and years and years. And even something that didn't really occur or something that was mis misunderstood will still be just as strong 40, 50 years later. Because they're gonna remember it exactly the way they experienced it. They saw something that was very frightening to them and fascinating. A lot of those people were not real thrilled about seeing it. Uh, they didn't, uh, some of them would not even go out at nighttime. You know, they, they became reclusive. Um, they felt that something was always looking over their shoulder or in their area of, of where they were, very paranoid. They didn't really like the attention they were getting from, from the townspeople because people th thought they were crazy or, you know, loony or whatever. And that's why a lot of those witnesses, even to this day, will not discuss it. They won't admit that it didn't happen. They, they will tell me it did happen. They saw it with their own eyes, but that's, that's all they want to say about it. Jeff has always been interested in strange phenomena. His obsession with the mysterious Mothman took root in childhood. He's spent years accumulating enough evidence to fill his Mothman museum. That makes him a leading authority on the creature and where it's likely to be seen. Okay, hey, these, these structures have been here for well over 60 years. They're relatively untouched. As you can see all the detail on these, you, you can actually walk underneath you know, look underneath, and, and they're very eerie, especially at night, especially when the fog starts setting out here. They're basically the same as they were back during World War II. When the war ended, uh, they just left everything. They never tore anything down. And uh, during the Mothman sightings, you know, a lot of people thought that whatever this thing was, 
was either roosting or staying in this, this general area up here in the TNT area. of the Silver Bridge a year after the first Mothman sightings shocks the residents of Point Pleasant. Engineers offer plausible explanations about why the 40-year-old bridge collapsed, but some people aren't so sure. They link the tragedy to unnatural causes. Some people say that the uh, Mothman had something to do with the Silver Bridge falling. My answer to that is the Silver Bridge fell because of a cracked eye bar. There was one eye bar that was uh, prior to the uh, Ohio uh, Tower on the bridge. It cracked, and that is what caused the bridge to fall. Now, the 13th pin, strangely enough, that held the bridge together, and scientifically speaking, or engineer, from an engineer's point of view, when they did test on the bridge after the accident, after it collapsed, they said that it was no wonder it didn't collapse earlier. It was old bridge, it was out of date, it needed to be changing. That's a matter of record. The fact that it was the 13th pin that went added, you know, another supernatural element to it. And it's great for the urban legend. It, it adds to it, makes it, it adds to the mystery. There are other people who say that the uh, Mothman was a, sort of a, an omen of the bridge falling. I don't know where they got that idea. Well, in the 60s, they had very bad, very poor, or it was just neglect in their uh, disposal of some of the byproducts of that uh, TNT factory. So it got into the aquifer. And the aquifer is the main water source, and they would have used it. And even though they may have had purification processes, which I'm sure got, gets out a lot of the uh, pollutants and carcinogens and what have you, some of it may have gotten through and may have caused a hallucinogenic effect. If, possibly, if the ground was saturated with some kind of unknown pollutant that caused a hallucinogenic effect, and you saw a true life cryptozoological cryptid creature, you're gonna start seeing all kinds of different things. And what looked, what is gonna be totally natural to uh, a biologist or an ornithologist or something like that, even with their amazement to people like you and me who's never seen these things before, it's gonna be frightening. I believe there's a lot of things that I just don't understand. And with that, I take it with a grain of salt, but I don't discredit what people are saying they're seeing. Many theories have been presented to justify or debunk the existence of Mothman. One comes from an unofficial branch of science known as cryptozoology. What do I think it is? I think uh, it does belong, the, the creature itself belong in the realm of cryptozoology. I think that uh, crypto meaning it's something different, something out of place, not natural to be found. And every once in a while, nature spits out something that shouldn't be there. And I think this is one such case. There were uh, several eyewitness descriptions and accounts of some of these Mothman sightings that pointed towards the possibility of, of it being maybe a thunderbird or a prehistoric bird. Um, I had actually talked to one lady who saw it in, in daylight in the TNT area, and she described it as a prehistoric bird. Some people felt that, that the Mothman may have actually been a thunderbird or something extinct. It's like any other crypto-type monster, like the Bigfoot legend, or in, or in the state of Florida, the skunk ape, or something like that. Many people say, yes, absolutely exist. We've seen it. We don't know what it is. Why aren't we catching these things? You'd think they would leave some kind of evidence. Uh, you know, well, what about a body? You know, anthropologists and, and archaeologists, they need these things, empirical data, to, to believe in it. And without that, it's going to remain in the realm of folklore or, or myth. 
Another theory suggests Mothman might be the result of some radical mutation of a life form exposed to radiation. I wish there were a lot more supernatural creatures that would make life more interesting. But I think in this case, it was just something that existed, uh, does exist still, and occasionally came out of there. He could have been mutated. It could have been mutated by that particular area, which was the grounds are poisoned. They still are even to this day. The EPA is trying to clean that up. Sometimes, uh, like if you remember the old B monster movies, you know, they, they got radiation or something that gets gargantic and what have you. In most cases, radiation just kills, pure and simple. But every once in a while, it alters DNA, it alters growth patterns and so forth in plants and in people. You know, after uh, uh, World War II, you can find all kinds of different effects from radiation for those who survived. Uh, frightening effects that make humans look non-human. So this could happen in nature too. And I think that's also a credible possibility. I think after the Silver Bridge collapsed, the, the whole town was in a state of shock. I mean, they'd never seen a disaster, you know, on that, that scale of, you know, 46 people, uh, you know, perishing in a, in a bridge disaster. It was the worst, worst bridge disaster in, in American history, still, still is. But I think it, it you know, it, it's, there was so much going on. People had a hard time um, absorbing all of the, the activity and the attention. But, you know, people still, you know, we're in the TNT area, you know, years and years, even to this day. It's, it's really difficult to, to say that, that that book will ever be closed on, you know, what this Mothman or large bird actually was. That's the whole beauty of the, the Mothman stories. People are always looking for answers. Mothman will probably always be around. I think the idea of this creature will always be around. It may indeed be something from the realms of complete supernatural, and it may blow our socks off someday by presenting itself. Maybe it is an alien life. I can't discount that. My personal belief system is that it's just a misidentification. It's a great story, though. I think if, if 20 years ago, somebody would have came forth and said, this is what it was, here's the proof, here's the documentation, book closed. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We just don't know until it dies in the woods and the forestry department picks it up and it becomes news and it goes in the classroom school books. It's gonna remain the monster that we know it is today. Whether Mothman is fact or fiction, horror or hoax, the creature towers over the daily life of Point Pleasant. Instead of ridicule, the Mothman book and movie has brought fame and fortune to this little village on the Ohio River. The movie changed things by putting us out there, putting Point Pleasant on the map. A big part of the climatic part of the movie is the bridge falling. Then now everyone wants to ask you about the Mothman, and, and anywhere you travel, if you're from Point Pleasant, always the first thing someone asks you about is, is the Mothman. But people had a hard time seeing that movie in town. Uh, it, it's hard to watch that bridge fall, and it's hard to watch the, the Mothman parts about it. When that movie came out, the floodgates just opened, and you know the, the town was just overrun. You know, people coming here. You know, they wanted to go where the, uh, you know, the, this actually happened. I knew right then that it, it, would, it would change the town. But you know, uh, whether you believe in the Mothman or not, it's done a lot for Point Pleasant. Mothman Festival is the single biggest attractor from throughout the country and the world than we have in, here in Point Pleasant. You can't 
drive down Main Street because it's full of people. And they come from all over the world. I, we've had people from China, Australia, Japan, England. They come from every place to come to this Mothman Festival. After the movie, The Mothman Prophecies came out, Jeff and Carolyn Harris came up with this idea that we should have a festival each year to bring all the people that would be interested in something like that. I was talking to Carolyn one day and I said, you know, um, we ought to try maybe a Mothman festival or a convention, something like that. That's, this was in November of 2002. This was just months after the movie came out. And we, we decided to give it a go. We decided like in October of that year to have it. So we only had a month. We didn't advertise. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really get it out to the media much, but we had four or 500 people just show up by word of mouth. And that was the catalyst for what now is the 12th year of the Mothman Festival. And we have speakers at the State Theater. We have entertainment on the Riverfront Park. And sometimes we have karaoke contests. We've had a weightlifting contest there. Uh, we have a lot of vendors out here, a lot of souvenirs. We have a witness panel that we pay to sit there and answer questions. People want to ask them in direct, for sure. You know, what did you see? They want to ask them. They like that uh, out there. And we try to add something every year. We have a 5K race. We have a big uh, Mothman beauty pageant. From the Mothman, glowing red eyes, 10 feet tall, baby, that's no lie. In the Mothman Festival pageant, we have moth wear, which is where contestants wear jeans, and then they are to incorporate the color green into their outfit. And we get wings sometimes. Contestants have wings. Sometimes uh, contestants just they want to show their personality so they're real stylish and upbeat. Um, they also compete in evening gown and onstage question. And what the judges usually try to look for is just a natural girl who is just wanting to really promote the Mothman Festival pageant and not just be after the crown and sash, but actually to promote the festival. I won in 2010. It was really actually quite surprising because I'd never done a pageant before, so I was really nervous. And I'd always liked the Mothman and all that stuff. So I thought, hey, why not? Let's try it. And then lo and behold, I won, which was absolutely insane. But the uh, pageant was actually really cool. Like we got to learn the Mothman dance, which was really fun. Mothman, he's not from Japan. He's genuine American. <laughs> People come from all over the world, literally, and that's why we call it the world's only Mothman Museum. But we have props, we have very rare archives, we had a lot of John Keel memorabilia, we carry merchandise, and we started, uh, you know, just opening two or three days a week. Now we're open seven days a week. And we're knowledgeable, people want to come in and, and ask us questions. We show documentaries and things like that. I really enjoy being a tour guide. I meet people from all over the world. It's really cool. We can take them up to the T area, let them see everything as far as different sites of Point Pleasant, um, tell them different stories um, that I've been told throughout the years about the Mothman and all the different encounters with him, stories I've actually heard from the eyewitnesses themselves. Then we get out and we check out the igloos and look at the first uh, where the first sighting was. Um, it's really, really entertaining. I enjoy it. Igloos are storage bunkers made of cement where ammunition was stored during the Second World War. Although there were never really actually any Mothman sightings reported in, in the igloos, it's still a fascinating part, a fascinating part of the history of the TNT area. Uh, as you can see, the four-foot thick walls. A lot of paranormal groups frequent the, the igloos because they, you know, they want to try to catch the orbs and different pictures and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a vital part of the Mothman history, and uh, I think it needs to be researched a, a little more. Yeah. 
It's been nearly 50 years since the Mothman and the Men in Black spooked a little village in West Virginia. But how things have changed. From the town's worst nightmare, Mothman has become a dream come true and a symbol of pride and joy for everyone. The Mothman is, is, is such a creature that uh, it's hard not to look at. He's, he sort of takes after Loch Ness Monster and, and Bigfoot, but I think ours is a little more exciting because he, uh, he just shows up everywhere and there's so much, uh, so many stories behind him that it's changed our town. One of the main attractions here in downtown Point Pleasant is the world famous uh, Mothman statue. That statue came about uh, two or three years after the movie was released and a local artist who works in stainless steel uh, named Bob Roach created that uh, statue after sitting down with some of the, Mo the Mothman witnesses and uh, eyewitnesses and things like that. And he came, his, came to his own you know, version of that Mothman. But people all over the world come to get their picture taken with that, uh, that statue. We unveiled the statue in a, in a ceremony that attracted national news. Uh, CBS Sunday morning came and it shocked all of us. We thought it would just be a few people from around town and maybe a couple local stations, but uh, we immediately went on national TV when, when the statue was unveiled. It's a really uh, nice piece of, of artwork, you know, and a lot of detail and things like that, but it's, it's a nice centerpiece to, to, to let people know, you know, what all happened here. Mothman is a big part of the history of Point Pleasant. There's other pieces of history, too. We have a Mothman tram that run, goes around through town. You can board it out here, and it'll take you to all of our entities that we have, uh, River Museum, behind the flood wall for the murals, uh, the Silver Bridge Memorial, uh, anything, anything we have, the Fort Randolph going on, but the tram will take you to show you that we have more than just Mothman. We have the history and the mystery. Families come from all over. Groups come, bus tours come, governors come and get their picture taken with the Mothman. It's not a true uh, visit to Point Pleasant unless you get your picture taken with the Mothman. I don't know how to explain it, but they're here every day, just about all year long. I don't care if it's raining, snowing, or what, there's people getting their picture taken with the Mothman. It's, it's really been a phenomenon that uh, you would never think about, but it's here. I can't say for sure whether it's real or not. Uh, I just know that there's a tremendous amount of evidence uh, that it is. We invite everybody to come here. We take them and, and show them all, all the different uh, attractions that are geared, geared towards it and let them make up their mind for themselves. The Mothman is a big thing with a lot of people. Uh, it's kind of put Point Pleasant on the map in most recent years. And people come just because they've heard of it. And it's sort of mysterious. And they want to see what it looks like. Uh, we have the statue in, in town. And um, so that's something that's visible to them, you know. We have so much American history here. We have a lot of agricultural history. Obviously, we have paranormal history. Plus, we just like having visitors. It, we, we really enjoy the people that come. Uh, everyone in town gets out and speaks to everyone, and uh, they get out on Main Street and sit in their rocking chairs and, and talk to all the folks that come in. It's, it's a perfect way to get people to come to Point Pleasant and, and then have a look around, and they may find something else they didn't know about. The people with the Mothman, they're never going to stop coming. We know that, and, and uh, we, we enjoy all the different ones that come.